This is the Let's Go Win Podcast with your host, J.M. Ryerson. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Let's Go Win. I'm really excited. You guys are going to love this guy's energy. He is incredible. Jordan Montgomery, owner of Montgomery Companies, is a highly regarded performance coach and keynote speaker whose clients include business executives, sales organizations, and entrepreneurs. From small town Iowa to a dominant force in the performance coaching industry, Jordan travels the country speaking and coaching executives at Fortune 500 companies, professional athletes, and salespeople. He has shared the stage with Aeneas Williams, Rory Vaden, Ron White, David Akers, Elizabeth Smart, Tom Ferry, and the list goes on. Jordan, what's up, man? How you doing? Hey, thanks for having me, Jay. I'm doing awesome. It's uh, just a pleasure and an honor to be on your show. Thanks for having me. Brother, it is my pleasure. I just, I had a chance to be on yours and I love the work you're doing. So you said from small town Iowa to performance coach, talk to me about that journey, brother. How did you know performance coaching? This is what I'm going to do. Yeah, I'm not sure if I ever really did know that, right? But I did know that I wanted to work with people um, all day, every day, loved relationships, loved watching people change, grow and evolve. And I've always just had a love for being in the arena, you know, competing, performing. And so for me, I, I had a career in the financial services space that allowed me to transition. I'll talk about that transition here shortly, but I had a, a really a moment in my life that allowed me to pivot into the space that I'm in now. I had a mentor, really two mentors that kind of pulled me into the space that I'm in today. Uh, but I'm an ordinary guy, man. I grew up in the cornfields of Iowa, Southeast Iowa. I'm from uh, Kelowna, Iowa, which is a one stoplight, don't blink kind of town. And, um, because of uh, a lot of good people around me and because God is good, he opened doors and we ended up uh, in, a, in a cool situation with a great business and um, really, really love the work that we're doing today. Well, I love the work you're doing. You're influencing people throughout and you're helping people get better. Talk to me about that mentorship, though. That is something that it sounds like you recognize an opportunity or perhaps two people recognize it in you and you took advantage of it. I think so often people... <laughs> don't see the opportunity that's right in front of them. It sounds like you captured that with the help of your mentors and thank goodness that you did. Well, you know, I, I think all too often we settle in life and, and good can be the enemy of great. And I would say I was in a fairly good situation, but there was something inside of me. I wasn't totally fulfilled. I wasn't um, truly content in the work that I was doing all day, every day in the, in the financial planning space. And it's a an amazing industry. Uh, we work with so many financial advisors that are doing honorable work, but I felt like there was a, a part of me that I wasn't deploring. You know, like there was a part of who God created me to be that I wasn't using. And um, I had a conversation with a friend of mine by, by the name of Ben Newman. And I was on my back porch. It was a Friday afternoon. I'll never forget it. And I just said, Ben, you know, I look at the work that you do and I look at the people that you spend time with and the content that you talk about and teach on. And I said, that, that would fill my cup, man. I'd love to do what you do. And that's the first point, right? Is I think you had to be willing to ask for help. You know, if you want to change, if you want to transition, if you want to step into a new space, you got to ask for help. And I don't think we ever outgrow that, JM. I think we always should be asking for help, regardless of how successful you become. I think the, the desire to ask for help should always be there, right? I think it is there. I think most people just don't want to ask. And so I think you got to ask for help. Um, secondly, I think you got to be willing to learn, right? And eat some humble pie. And I think for me, um, I asked a lot of questions, but then I also applied what I learned. And I think some people forget that being coachable means that you circle back with the person who taught you and share the learning, you know, because if you're, if you're teachable, you'll pursue a moment. If you're coachable, you'll pursue a relationship. And so there's a lot of things that I did wrong. One of the things that I did well from an early stage is I would circle back with people. I just say, Hey, here's what I learned. I appreciate you pouring into me. Sometimes they were pouring into me through a keynote speech. Sometimes it was a virtual event. I mean, oftentimes they never even met me, right? I read a book or I listened to their podcast and I'd circle back and say, hey, you taught me these three things. Super valuable. Just wanted to say thanks. One of those guys for me was a guy by the name of Ben Newman. I went to a sales event 10 years ago, St. Louis, Missouri. Ben taught me a bunch of stuff. Kind of knew him, but didn't really circle back with him, grow a relationship. 10 years later, reached out, asked for help. Uh, and he ultimately cast a vision for me to grow a coaching business, which is what we have today. And so I pivoted from the financial services business to the coaching space. Um, and God's opened some doors and we never looked back. 
I hope you guys hear this because so often I, I know people hear something, it's profound, it's really affected them. You took the chance or you're willing to say, hey, I wanted to thank you for teaching me these things, but literally reaching out. I, I mean, maybe there's no question here. I just, do you see that often with your own clients where it's, man, there's something, just go for it. Put yourself out there because that's really what I'm hearing you doing. You're saying, hey, Ben, I really appreciate what you did, A. B, I'd love to follow up. Do you see that often with the clients you're working with? You know, I think most people would consider themselves to be coachable. If you ask the average person, are you coachable? They would say yes. But most people are not coachable. Most people are teachable. That is, they're willing to learn and they're even willing to apply, but they forget about the ongoing opportunity. And the ongoing opportunity is to grow a relationship. It's to circle back. It's to ask more questions. It's to engage. It's to add value. And not so that you can get something out of it, but it's to, to truly share your appreciation. It's to live with a heart of gratitude is to say, thank you. Thanks for teaching me. Thanks for growing me. Thanks for what you've poured into me. And I think when you do that, the world just opens up. So we've made that a regular practice in our world, JM. If somebody teaches me something, a podcast, a book, a keynote speech, whether I was in the room or not, whether I was directly affected or not, meaning I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation or not, I'm going to share what I learned. I, I think a lot of people miss that. I missed it for a good portion of my life. I'm fortunate that I had a lot of mentors that modeled that for me, but the world opens up when you're willing to share your gratitude. Yeah. I had this conversation last night, interestingly enough. And one of the challenges I've always had is I'll give, 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 but sometimes receiving not the best at, and it sounds like, brother, it's, I know you give and you definitely, but you're also so willing to receive. Talk to me about, is that something you learned from, from, you know, your parents? Is that something biblical? I don't know, because it's something I'm truly working on is somebody gives you a compliment, receive that, validate what they said. So can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, let's use that example. Cause that's a great example. We see that every day, right? Somebody gives somebody a compliment. They kind of shrug it off. They don't want to accept it. I think that happens for all of us. It's sort of natural to do that, right? Somebody says, oh, JM, you, you killed it. You crushed it. And you kind of go, oh, I don't know. You know, you're just saying that or whatever. Um, I think if you really understand that your gifts aren't your own, it allows you to receive that in a different way. So as a person of faith, JM, I can say, hey, my gifts aren't my own. You know, I was given a gift. I believe that it comes from the Lord, it comes, from, it comes from God. Um, I get to steward that gift. So I get to grow that gift. I get to exercise that gift. I get to steward that gift, but it's not my own. The gift is bigger than me. It wasn't designed for me to build my own kingdom. It was designed for me to help other people and ultimately to grow God's kingdom. So if that's true, then I should be able to receive that compliment and go, thanks, praise God. He did give me a gift and it's not my own. And it's nothing I've done, you know, to, to, um, achieve the gift. It's like, I, I had a gift. Now I've worked hard at stewarding the gift and I'm still working hard at stewarding that gift. But I think somebody that really lives with a strong sense of self that understands their gifts are not their own receives a compliment and says, man, thank goodness I have it right. Praise God. It's not my own. Thank you for that compliment. Yeah, man, just because you come from that small town background, I know one of the things that I learned was make it not about yourself, be humble. And that's where I think I applied it incorrectly. I like the way you said that you said, thanks, praise God. And it's so simple. And yet it's, it's greatly understood. Like, yeah, thank you. And so you validate it and you gave it to someone not bigger than you. That's pretty interesting. I got to talk to you about uh, failure. And the reason I say this, because you come from the financial service field originally, and now, uh, you know, into coaching, but failure is a natural part of what we do. When I say that, do you have a process of dealing with failure? What, what's kind of the mindset, if you will, behind how you deal with failure? Well, in our business, we use the mantra, uh, build the plane as you fly it, you know, which means you just fail a lot. Parts are falling off the plane. The thing's about ready to crash. It almost does crash, then it doesn't. Then a wing falls off, then the windshield breaks. But we're still flying. We're still moving forward. And I think you either win or you learn, you know? And um, the greatest growth that's come in my life has come from failure. I was, I was 27 years old and I was running a large financial services firm. I was flying all around the country, speaking to other firms. 
um, inside of the firm that I worked with, I, I had tremendous influence. Uh, we had grown something really special at a very young age. Uh, but I was, I was going like a million miles a minute and I was living for the ways of the world. My spirit was so caught up in my bank account, my reputation, my production, my achievement. Um, and all of that changed almost overnight. There was a staff member of mine who took a test um, and I didn't report it. I was just going really fast. Uh, she didn't, she wasn't malicious in how she went about it. She was just like, Hey, I, I'm trying to help. Let me do this. She took some, some liberties. She probably shouldn't have taken. Um, I didn't deal with it the right way. And because I didn't deal with it as a supervisor, I got let go. Now I didn't get let go for a long time. The, the company ended up kind of taking me back and we fixed it. But what happened is in that process, I lost about 90% of my clients, which meant I lost about 90% of my revenue. So I literally went from running a high level, you know, seven figure revenue business to losing 90% of it overnight. I was in the middle of building a house. Uh, it was just a, this perfect storm where God said, hey, like enough is enough. And I don't think he caused it, but I think sometimes he allows certain things to happen. And in that moment, JM, I was completely broken, totally humbled. And for the first time, I was really, I was really willing to say, all right, God, like, what do you want to do with my life? I have to listen to you. Um, I've been trying to muscle this thing out on my own. Uh, I really am a pretty broken dude who needs you desperately. Would you, would you show me? And I started to pray and um, I started to ask the, the real questions about life. Who am I becoming? Who do I really want to be? What am I living for? And it started to change the way that I move forward. And, and it was a part of how I ended up where I ended up today. But the last thing I'll say about that is, you know, I think sometimes when we go through loss or failure, we want things to be restored to us in the same vein. So here I was, I was this young 27 year old man that lost a lot of money and I lost professional status. And so I wanted God to restore that to me, right? It was like, okay, I lost all this money. I'm ready for the money to come back. I lost my status. I'm ready for the status to be replaced or restored. What I didn't know is that I was going to become a dad and I was going to adopt two children. I was going to marry a woman named Ashley, who's my now wife. We're about to have a third, a third child, right? Two adopted. We have one on our, one on our own. And, and I needed, there were some things inside me that needed to change, like inner pride, the pace of life, my perspective, what was important, my value system. So what was cool about that, that failure experience JM is um, some things fell apart for some really good things to come together. And I think a lot of times as humans, we want to see those things restored in the same vein. And a lot of times they're not right. Like brokenness is a powerful, a powerful position. And sometimes preparation is packaged as pain. When you're being prepared for another chapter, a lot of times you deal with pain. And sometimes God's preparation is packaged as pain. And so that's what I learned in going through failure at a young age. I'm still learning that today. I hope I never stop failing because if I'm failing, it means I'm doing something significant and I'm using the gifts that God gave me. Yeah, man. I love what you said again, I, man, I'm taking all your stuff because it's good. Preparation is packaged as pain. That's really interesting because again, we don't, nobody wants to hurt. We don't want to go through it. But I feel like the greatest learning lessons are from failure. I, is that is it fair to say we learn more from failure, failure than we do from success? Yeah, I think that's a mantra that gets thrown around, but I, I think it's profoundly true. You know, um, I think that, you know, I mean, you go all the way back to, to biblical times, right? Again, as a person of faith, I just I think about the, the, the people that God used were people that that failed, right? The people who were wounded most deeply are typically used the most mightily. And, you know, go back and look at anyone who's ever done anything, right? Thomas Edison, Susan B. Anthony, Martin Luther King, Steve Jobs. I mean, you go, go through the list. Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, they were wounded deeply. They went through something really significant. I had somebody tell me the other day, he said, I never want to have a business partner that hasn't hit rock bottom because there's something different. There, there's a substance, there's a depth of a person, there's a perspective and an understanding of a person who's hit rock bottom that's different. And I want that out of my closest relationships. And so, yeah, I think you're tested. I think something is, is formed inside of you that otherwise wouldn't be there if you hadn't hit rock bottom. You guys heard it, man. Embrace that. You, something you're getting your butt kicked right now. It's okay. Learn from it. I, I, again, you said you either win or learn. I love that. By the way, congrats on the, the third baby on the way. That's amazing. Um, Thank you. Yeah, dude. That's I, so I get that goes right along with what really inspires you today. So we dealt with the failure side of things. 
what is it that really gets you know jordan just revs his engines and really gets you to show up the way you do in the world today well there's a lot of ways i can answer that question um i think the thing that gives me the most joy if i if i just if i just assess the list of things that give me joy i think seeing my kids light up brings me the most joy you know so i could nail it at a on a show or podcast or speaking engagement you know, and somebody says, oh, you did a great job or, you know, and that's a, that's one type of feeling, but it doesn't compare to the feeling that you get from seeing your kid or your child light up, you know? Um, and I know that you can relate to that. I just got back from a, a mountain biking trip and I walked in the door and my three daughters gave me a big hug and they're excited to see dad after being gone, you know? So to me, that, that probably brings me the most joy. Um, and I think it goes along with one of my life missions. I, I want to be respected the most by people who know me the best, you know? And it's taken me a long time to get there. When I was young, I, I just wanted everyone to like me. I wanted to grow this reputation and I wanted, I wanted to be seen a certain way. And I think as you get older, you start to understand how little that matters. You know, um, my social circle has gotten smaller. Maybe the impact's gotten bigger, but the actual amount of people that I have a true relationship with has gotten smaller because you spend more time with your kids and your family. And so you, you start to understand that the model for growth is really to go deeper with fewer who go deeper with fewer. And that includes my family. And so if I can be respected most by people who know me the best, um, to me, that's, that's success. You know, that's a life worth pursuing and living. So I love that question. Well, I think everybody listening right now is going, I want to have fulfilling relationships. I don't need to have thousands of friends. I want to have truly fulfilling relationships. And that's one thing you're an expert at is relationship building. What are some of the key tenets, brother, for people to follow that to really have those fulfilling relationships? Because it is unique. It's amazing. But you are, you're truly gifted at it. So what are some of the things people could really learn and apply from you? Well, I think number one is to ask a lot of questions. You know, Dale Carnegie said it best. He said a person's favorite sound is their own name and their favorite topic is themselves. So, you know, you want to draw near to people, you want to add value, you ask great questions and not just questions, but great questions, get them to think, engage them in meaningful and interesting conversations. So, you know, I don't always like the question. So tell me about your background. How'd you get to where you're at today? I mean, those questions are fine, but those questions have been answered by that individual literally thousands of times. So you're not going to stand out and you don't really activate the brain in a meaningful way. If you want to activate the brain in a meaningful way, you'll ask questions that you just asked. Tell me about what you've learned from failure. You know, what's the greatest lesson you've ever learned? What are you learning right now? What have you read recently that I should read? What have you done that I should do? Um, I mean, those are great questions that engage people in a unique and different way. So ask great questions is the first one. I'd say the second thing is add value, add real value. Um, and for someone listening, they might say, well, listen, I'd love to add value if I had all kinds of wisdom and expertise and life experience. If I'd written a book like JM, I mean, that'd be easy. I could hand my books out. It's not about that. You know, adding value starts with providing attention, support, empathy. Sometimes it's counsel, right? But a lot of times it's not. It's, it's just being who you are. It's giving your full attention, giving your full support, you know, being empathetic. Um, so I think it's adding value and I think it's asking great questions. I think if you become really good at those two things, you can make friends with just about anybody and be masterful in building authentic, meaningful relationships. Yeah, and one of the things you do is you you are truly gifted at communication. And, and again, you ask great questions. Isn't that such an interesting thing? It's not like he's the greatest speaker of all time. It's you ask incredible questions. You listen extremely well. Talk to me about your communication style. How did you learn it? How have you developed it? Because truly, again, I was a guest on your podcast. You listen. I, I can see your brain literally soaking in the question before you speak again. So talk to me about that communication. Where did you learn that from? Well, I think I've been fortunate to be around a lot of other communicators, but more importantly, I've been around a lot of connectors. You know, there's a big difference between communicating and connecting. And I think a communicator is really focused on what they're saying and how they're delivering their words. A great connector is focused on how the audience is receiving their words. And so I think, again, if we're going to add value and be great relationship builders, we have to be effective communicators, which means I'm focused less on what I'm saying. 
I'm focused more on how people are hearing me and receiving me. And, um, you know, I think it goes back to just being others focused, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I'm, if I'm really, truly tapping into what people want, what's adding value to them, what they like, if I'm paying attention to their nonverbal cues, you know, I'm, I'm paying attention to their posture, their body language, it becomes easier to say, okay, what does JM really need out of this conversation? What's he, you know, is he picking up what I'm saying? Is this connecting? Is this resonating? And I think some of us, we get in our own head and we're so focused on delivering what we want to deliver and we miss it. You know, we want to get through our notes and make sure we get through our, you know, the whole speech or the, the full statement. And, um, and we miss the opportunity to connect with the people in front of us. So I'm going to take a guess here. Uh, I'm guessing you're a pretty, pretty voracious reader. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I, I read quite a bit. I'm more on Audible. I hear, I don't, I don't read a lot of physical books, but I'm a big Audible guy. And um, yeah, so I, I, audiobook is my thing. All right. So give me your top three most impactful books that have really shaped your thinking. Something that really stands out where you're like, oh, you guys got to listen to this one or you got to read this one. Yeah, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie might be number one. Uh, Think Again by Adam Grant. It's a new book. I love the subtitle, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. It's a book all about self-awareness, situational awareness. I think the first step to personal growth and development is self-awareness. Just believe that to be true. And the entire book is about that topic. Most people think they are self-aware. If you think you're really self-aware, you're probably not very self-aware. It's an interesting relationship between, you know, what you think to be true and, and what is actually true. Um, I probably, um, I fall into that bucket somewhere, which is why I'm passionate about the book. And then, you know, the third for me would be the Bible. And it's actually probably first in, in terms of importance and what I've learned um, from the reading. But, you know, I think those three books have been life-changing for me. I could give you several more, but if you're asking for three that have been really meaningful, um, those three have been very meaningful. Well, I'd love because that's the first time the, the Adam Grant, that specific book has been mentioned. So for that to be that impactful to you so quickly, I'm excited. I can't wait to read. I, I think Adam Grant's brilliant, which is uh, he is. Um, and I, one of the things that you also talked about is Dale Carnegie. And when I think of leaders, when I think of somebody that wrote a book back in the 20s and is still applicable today, that's remarkable in itself. Tell me some of the less lessons you got from that book and what are some of the leadership lessons we could really learn from somebody that, again, wrote this book almost a hundred years ago that's still applicable today? You know, Dale Carnegie was master at building relationships, right? Which is why I wrote the book. And the whole book's about adding value. It's about influencing people and moving people in a specific direction. And I go back to the, the number one lesson that, that, I, that I've learned from the book. I think the thing that really stood out to me most, which is why I talked about it earlier in the show, is what lights people up, you know, what allows you to really connect with people. And it's you centered communication. So there's me centered communication. There's you centered communication. If you study the average salesperson, they spend a good majority of their dialogue in me centered communication, and they don't even realize it. If you really want to be effective in communicating, you tap into you centered communication. What's a person's favorite sound? It's their own name. What's their favorite topic? It's them, right? Um, we train a lot of salespeople. And so we'll, we'll go through like an approach, right? Or a pitch. Some people call it the pitch or the approach. So I'll say, Hey, give me your approach. Give me your pitch. And they'll go on this five or six minute monologue about their product or their company or their process. So they'll get to the end of that. And I'll say, Hey, if I was on the other side of that, what do you think I'd be thinking as you shared that? And they said, Oh, you'd probably be thinking like, um, can I trust this guy? Uh, are his products any good? You know, how long has the company really been around? You know, is it a stable company? And I said, yeah, you know, you'd be really lucky if that's what I was thinking. What I'd probably be thinking about is what I'm making for dinner that night, the fight I got in with my wife that morning, and what time we're picking up the kids from school, right? So the point is people aren't paying attention. We, our attention spans are so short. And as communicators, if we're communicating with me-centered communication, we're going to miss people. Because they're not thinking about us. They're thinking about themselves. And so a great communicator grabs people's attention. Attention is currency. And I get your attention by talking about you. I don't get your attention by talking about me. So if attention is currency, I want to grab your attention. I want to pull you into the conversation. 
you centered communication becomes very important. And Dale Carnegie says it in a different way, but that's the essence of his book, right? Is adding value, paying attention to other people and delivering and driving you focused conversation and communication. I think the most recent study I saw was 12 seconds is the average attention attention span right now. So literally every 12 seconds, people are going in and out. That's remarkable. Um, another person that I know you really follow and somebody that we both admire, especially in the leadership field, is John Maxwell. What do you think people really miss or could really work on to increase their leadership lid, to really show up in the world and influence more people. If we, if that's an agreed upon leadership is principle, or excuse me, is influence, excuse me, leadership is influence. If we both agree to that principle, what, how do you think people can really help influence more people? Well, I think number one, less is more. Uh, you know, that's the essence. To me, that's the magic of John Maxwell is he says less than other people say and accomplishes and achieves way more. He's a masterful in his communication style. He's the ultimate connector, you know, and it would take me as somebody who communicates publicly for a living, it would take me 500 words to say the same thing that takes John Maxwell a hundred words. When he speaks, you feel like he's speaking directly to you. Like he's having a conversation. Uh, he is simple. He repeats himself. He speaks in incredibly practical terms that people can understand and relate to. And because of that, he has an enormous impact. He's the ultimate connector and he keeps things simple. I think that's the magic of John Maxwell. Yeah, he is really remarkable in how he does that. And he's got this kind way about him. It is pretty awesome. Let me ask you this, because this is my favorite question to ask, because this is, in my opinion, what everybody's looking for. What does freedom really mean to you? When I say Jordan... You just got back from a mountain bike. Maybe it was Jordan cruising down a mountain way too fast, I'm sure. But what does freedom really mean to you in your life today? Wow. Uh, well, again, I, I could answer that question probably a lot of different ways. I think freedom is closely tied to identity. You know, because if you're really firm in your identity, that is who we, you were created to be, who you know yourself to be. Um, I think you can. I think you can be free. Like I... I can set myself free from the expectations of this world that anybody else puts on me because I know the expectations that God has for me. So as a person of faith, I can say, Hey God, you created me to be a certain way. You gave me these qualities. Um, you instilled these things. You surrounded me with these people. Um, he's giving me my life. And so um, as a response to that, I think I can be free in um, my identity. I can say, Hey, I'm a father. I'm a husband. You've given me these gifts. I want to use these gifts each and every day. And if I do that, I can be free. It's not about the money I make. It's not about the books that I write, the podcast episodes that I produce. Um, I can be free to be me because you made me to be me. And I want to accept that. And I'm, I'm thankful for the gift of life. And that's freedom. I love it. It's, it, it. it's such a deep question. I love how easily you answered that. Tell me what uh, Montgomery companies, what are y'all working on? What's, what's the future? What, what do you guys, what's, what's the next couple of years look like for you guys? And what are you up to? Yeah, great question. We talked about books earlier on your show, um, on my show, sorry. And so we're, we're cooking up a book, which is exciting. It'll be our first book. So that's uh, a fun thing that we're working on as a company. Uh, we're growing our team. We're growing our coaching business. We have 10 coaching partners right now. We're about ready to bring on the 11th, which is exciting. So we're expanding our work in the coaching space. Um, we're working with, you know, sales people, athletes, executive leaders. Um, and, you know, keynote speaking is starting to open back up. So all of a sudden the, the calendar's ramping back up. You know that from doing the work that you do, JM. But um, I mean, we're so blessed and fortunate to be doing a lot of work in that space. And so Speaking, coaching, writing, all of it, right? We just, we love it. I got a webinar series coming up with Damon West, author of The Coffee Bean in July. Uh, we're working on nailing something down with John Gordon. So him and I are going to do a show together, which is super fun. Uh, we just did a deal with David Nurse, which just exploded. Um, super fun. Love that guy. So, you know, for us, it's about connecting with good people and it's just putting about more good content out into the world. Well, you're doing it, brother, and congrats on bringing on more partners. That just means more people you can help influence around the world, which is awesome. 
Uh, what should I ask you that I just didn't know enough to ask? I, you know, you're like, man, JM, you got to ask me this. I got to tell the audience X. What what should I have asked you? I didn't know enough to ask. Um, you know, <clears throat> I think you covered it, man. I, I, I'll just say this. I'll say this on the show. Usually we leave this conversation for afterwards. Uh, but I want your listeners to hear this because I go on a lot of shows. You get interviewed on different podcasts. Man, you are intentional. You're thoughtful. You ask great questions. I can see you taking notes as you listen to the question and I can tell you're dialed into the next question that you're going to ask. And it really changes the way that these episodes turn out. So you've got a following, you've got people listening to you probably has less to do with the person you're interviewing and more to do with how you set up the conversation. So um, you don't need to ask me anything because you asked it all. And I just appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. Um, thank you. Seriously. Thanks for, thanks for having me. This conversation was awesome. Ah, uh, brother, truly, you're the one bringing value. I think the audience is definitely going to feel that. How can our listeners connect with you online? If somebody's like, hey, I want to be a coach, but Montgomery Companies, look at me. How can we connect with Jordan Montgomery online? Yeah, I would say we do most of our content on Instagram. Uh, it's Jordan M, as in Michael. So Jordan M Montgomery is my last name. It's our Instagram handle. So go check us out on Instagram. Uh, send me a message. I'd love to connect with you. I respond to all the messages that are sent to us on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook. We're, we're pretty active on all the social media channels, LinkedIn. Our website is montgomerycompanies.com. And you can find out anything that you'd want to know about our work on the website. So uh, yeah, we'd love to engage with any listeners. Or if there's anything that we can do to add value um, in a small way, in a big way, we, we'd love to connect with anybody who's listening. Definitely do it, guys. He's literally got, I got to ask you, I should have done it earlier, but I'm sitting there looking at the goat and most people's opinion, Michael Jordan, right over your right shoulder. Were you named after him? Does it have anything to do with it? And uh, maybe you, you're, you, maybe you were, gosh, you're pretty young, but um, uh, is there significance to Michael Jordan being behind you? You know, here's the significance. Um, my wife designed the home. And I got to pick out like, you know, I picked out like three to five things. Candidly, I didn't want to say in a lot, right? Like I just like, hey, you're going to do it. It's going to look better. Um, but then I did get to say in the office. So this is our home office. And when I walked in, I, just, I wanted to be inspired when I walked into my home office. And to me, Michael Jordan, I'm a big sports guy. So he's, my opinion, next to Jesus, right? Um, he is one of the most inspiring people just because of how he competed, um, how he worked, how he showed up every day. And I wanted to show up with a certain fire every day. So I'm in this room about 5 a.m. every morning. That's the first picture I see. It's a decent way to wake up. It's a good way to start the day. That is the only significance to that picture is just a guy that I appreciate, respect. Thought putting MJ on the wall might not be a bad start, start to each, each and every day. I love it, man. I look, the, he is inspired. You want to talk in, inspiration. He has inspired so many of us that love playing basketball. He was that guy. So I, I absolutely love it. You guys make sure to check Jordan out. I think his company, what they're doing is beautiful. They're bringing so much value to the world. Jordan, man, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. JM, thanks for having me, man. It was a blessing and an honor. I'm wishing you the best moving forward. Uh, thank you, seriously, for having me on the show today. It means a lot. Uh, guys, I, I hope you listen to this, re-listen to it. I literally do have a page of notes. He said it. I was taking notes. I starred so many of them because I'm like, I got to use that. That's incredible. <laughs> uh, so make sure to check it out. In the meantime, you guys, until next week, continue to transcend in life, and we'll talk to you then. Have a great one. Thank you so much for listening. If this content is delivering value to you, please make sure to subscribe, rate, and review us. That helps us build this community, and that is what we are all about. Building this community as big as we can, helping as many people as we can, and deliver as much value as possible. Be sure to head over to letsgowinpodcast.com for information on my coaching courses, and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Let's Go Win 365. Let's go win and transcend in life. This is the Let's Go Win Podcast with your host, J.M. Ryerson. 